I can uh, I can tell where people are sitting. So everybody's uh, according to their groups here, as it would appear, because there's nobody in the middle. I'll take that as a yes. All right. So uh, just a few uh, housekeeping announcements uh, as we get started. Um, today is actually um, uh, the last session of uh, part three uh, that I'll be giving. Uh, on Thursday, we have a uh, guest lecture from Professor Larry Burns. Uh, Professor Burns is a, a former executive at General Motors. Uh, he is uh, known as a visionary uh, in the field of uh, sustainable transportation. We're lucky to have him on the faculty here at the University of Michigan. Um, he is going to present a, a vision for sustainable mobility that's going to be several steps beyond you know, anything we've talked about this term. Uh, you know, we've talked about alternative fuels, which we'll get to today. We've talked about electrification. We've talked about light weighting, um, alternative power sources for battery electric vehicles, et cetera. Uh, but what he's going to present uh, is a radical transfer, uh, transformation regarding how we move around. I've seen the presentation before, it's phenomenal. Uh, and from the standpoint of, you know, a student in 265, you know, wondering, you know, what's in it for you in terms of sitting through the guest lecture, I think it, you're going to get a lot out of just the topic. Uh, but, you know, I want you to be thinking about, um, y you know, whether the, the proposals, I'll call them proposals or the vision, uh, is something that is sustainable or not. Remember that sustainability's got three elements, right? The triple bottom line. Uh, the economic aspect, the environmental aspect, and the social aspect. Now, um, safety is something we haven't talked about in 265. Uh, you can think of safety as, as being, uh, first of all, it's paramount to any uh, sustainability activity. Uh, but you can think of it as, as societal, right? because it has to do with people and the consequences of technology. You can also think about it as function, right? And, you know, as engineers, we really need to be mindful that really it's not just a triple bottom line, it's a quadruple bottom line, and we've got to think a lot about functionality, right? And obviously safety is a key function. It's the first function uh, that goes into any engineering design. So think about the uh, vision for, for transformation in, in the area of sustainable mo mobility from, from those four um, perspectives. And I think Professor Burns would, would appreciate it, you know, if there was a, a heavy amount of interaction. Uh, so do feel free to, uh, you know, interrupt him. I will tell you that uh, Professor Burns has a uh, hearing assist in his ear, so uh, I may have to do some assistance in terms of getting questions relayed, uh, especially in this setting. Uh, but don't let that stop you, okay? And I know he'll, he always makes a remark to that effect before he gets started. Uh, so I hope to see you here on Thursday. Um, uh, there will not be a quiz, and we're not going to take attendance. So uh, this is purely for your edification, uh, although you could end up with a, a question on the, on the final that relates to it, uh, not in a detailed way, but um, some of the LCA topics we're talking about, functional unit, reference flow, allocation, et cetera, uh, these apply to Thursday's lecture as well, and uh, we've talked a lot about mobility. Okay. Uh, any questions before we get started? I think people are seated in their groups already. We have a um, final exam that's a week from Friday. Uh, we're going to be announcing uh, review sessions. I, I need to turn my attention toward that final exam. I've been uh, putting material together for new material for 265. It's been pretty time consuming. Uh, now that today my last lecture is done, I can start thinking about the final. Uh, but it's going to be next uh, Friday, uh, and uh, we will be announcing review sessions ahead of time. I don't think Vinit's done that yet. Is that correct? All right, so you should expect to hear something a bit later in the week uh, regarding review sessions. As I've mentioned many times, um, the, uh, it's a cumulative final exam, uh, but it's going to be weighted toward the third part. So think of it as four questions, two of which will be from part three. So that's the stuff that I've delivered. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not expecting any surprises, but I haven't seen the questions from the other instructors yet, so I'm hoping to see them soon. Uh, and in terms of the instructions for the final, uh, we'll get that out to you by email. Uh, we'll certainly go over it on Tuesday. So Tuesday is going to be a review session, so if you can uh, put some time into 265, 
uh, over the weekend, and I, I think particularly in the first two parts. So um, we're going to have uh, Professor Petrovis, uh, Petrovskas here, as well as Professor Lestowski here, and uh, you'll have a chance to ask them questions as well as me. So we'll just briefly go over, uh, you know, what we covered in our parts and uh, open it up to questions. Okay, so that's going to be Tuesday. Any questions? You have an assignment due Tuesday as well. Uh, what I hope is that uh, you've had plenty of time to work on that. Uh, I mentioned last week that I would be adding a question uh, to the assignment uh, that's been done now, and that relates to today's case study on biofuels. Are there any questions? All right, so I think that's uh, pretty clear in terms of housekeeping. So. Uh, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish in, in part three, I, I want to tell you that I've been uh, just thrilled uh, with uh, your reaction to, to part three and how things are going. Um, and, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and I, I have a sense that this biofuels case study is going to go pretty quickly, uh, just because of how well you did last Thursday on the light bulb example. Uh, so um, what I wanted to do before we get to that is to spend about 15 minutes or so uh, talking to you, uh, going back to a refrigerator. So you've done an LCA um, in-class exercise on, on the refrigerator. But I want to just present to you what an LCA actually looks like. So we've been spoon-feeding you information. So basically, you know what the concept of an LCA is, and you know how to connect it to economics and finance. And I'm very confident about that. Uh, but what I'm less confident about is your ability to read an LCA and extract the information from the LCA. And that's what uh, part or question four on assignment nine is really getting at. Uh, you've got basically the setup that you read for today, and then there's a uh, paper from which the life cycle assessment information came from. Uh, so what I want to do at the beginning of class here is to just go over what a typical LCA looks like. Um, it's not the same one that you're going to uh, read for next Tuesday. And actually, you don't even need to fully read it. You've got a good sense of what the um, the life cycle of biofuels is already, uh, just from uh, getting ready for class today. But you are going to need data from the tables. Uh, so you'll at least need to go back and, and read the tables from that paper. Uh, and and I, w I want you to really have a sense of where the data in those tables come from. And I also have some concerns because we didn't you know, give you an assignment that you know, makes you think about a reference flow or an allocation, or you know, some of the other aspects of, of LCA besides the calculations that you're really comfortable with that and you're ready for it for next week. Uh, so that's where this uh, in-class exercise comes from. So uh, I want you to just take two minutes and uh, answer this question. So you're a product developer. You're overseeing a team that will design a sustainable refrigerator. So you are a product manager, maybe the kind of uh, work that some of you will do when you graduate. Uh, and your company has uh, slated uh, a, a new model of refrigerator. It's their sustainable refrigerator. Call it whatever you want, uh, the green 200 or whatever. And uh, you're the manager, so you're the one who has to figure out whether it's sustainable or not. Now, we are going to take the economic dimension of sustainability out of the equation because uh, we're going to say here at the bottom uh, that we're confident that it will succeed in the market. So really, this is about the environmental sustainability and the environmental attributes. I want you to think, uh, and you're welcome to talk to each other, about uh, how you would go about figuring out whether this refrigerator is actually sustainable or not. What process uh, would you use? What questions would you ask? All right, so talk to each other. Take a couple minutes, and then we'll uh, discuss it.
Okay, one more minute. Okay, it's getting a little quieter here, so let's, uh, let's ask for a volunteer. What, uh, what, at a high level, what uh, kind of process would you use? Anybody? So that would be the economic dimension. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in how to do those uh, types of calculations, um, supply and demand, uh, you may want to consider taking ME589, so Sustainable Design of Technology Systems, a class I teach, uh, usually in the fall, uh, grad undergrad class. So we, these are exactly the kinds of things that we uh, discuss in that class. Because you know a product that has good environmental attributes uh, that doesn't sell is just junk. Uh, so either we need a, a policy driver or an economic driver, so we talk a lot about those. So that's the economic side. So then what would we do on the environmental side to make an assessment? Okay, so the, the magic uh, three letters are L, C, and A uh, for the day. And um, yeah, and these would be the questions that show up there. You would look at um, various uh, energy and material inputs. You would look at air emissions, water emissions. Uh, you'd look at solid waste emissions and evaluate it most likely against what's out there already, right? So, uh, you know, you could set your own threshold how much better than the competition you need to be to provide an equivalent function, uh, we need to talk some more about that, uh, than the uh, competitor refrigerator. So say you've got the same functionality as uh, other products in the market, but you, know, you reduce environmental impact by 20%. And then you'd obviously have to hone in on what that 20% means. So you remember in the first day of class, we watched one of those Autodesk videos, and we we're talking about the washer and dryer. Um, so the question becomes, okay, which metrics would you actually consider? And refrigerants would be a big one and energy would be a big one as well. Those are probably the two biggest ones you'd look at for a refrigerator. So an LCA of a refrigerator, uh, what is a, let's, let's talk about some of these terms. Uh, question. So the, uh, you know, and it may have been uh, easier than, than uh, it sounds, right? So one is we think about different metrics, right? So that's an obvious one. And LCA um, uh, deals with uh, questions of, you know, water pollution and air pollution and, and life cycle cost is just dollars, right? So the units are different, right? Um, secondly, um, life cycle cost uh, has a, um, it's, it's not like a, um, a standard, right? So it's just something you look at. Uh, LCA is actually a defined standard. It's um, uh, ISO 14000 uh, process. And we have those four stages that we talked about early on. Goal definition, scoping, uh, inventory analysis, impact analysis, and interpretation. Okay, so there's a formal process for life cycle assessment, but there isn't one uh, for life cycle costing, okay? 
Um, and uh, you, know, you can take that into a lot of directions for finding a third thing, right? So there's no uh, impact analysis, for instance, on a, on a life cycle costing um, uh, system. Uh, you know, your uh, data collection uh, is a lot less in question because, uh, you know, it's really just an inflation factor. So um, in terms of grading that, um, you know, in, in an answer key, basically what I told them was, you know, there's two things that you should expect and then a third thing that we'll just see what we get. Um, but uh, it's the units are different, number one, and number two is that there's a formal process for LCA, but there isn't one for life cycle costing. Mm-hmm. They have a lot in common, too, right? So uh, things like allocation that we talked about. We might have emphasized more about what they have in common than they have apart. So uh, that's why that was a thought-provoking question, I think. Any questions about that? OK, um, so uh, what's the function of a refrigerator? Somebody say keep the beer cold? All right. All right, that's good. All right, so... Uh, all right, so uh, we know what a refrigerator does. Uh, what would a functional unit for a refrigerator be? It right, functions to keep stuff cold. So that's a high-level function. But if we're going to do an LCA on a refrigerator, we have to define the functional unit. And there could be any number of functional units, but can somebody give me an example of one? Anybody remember back to when we discussed it in class? Good. So that would be part of a functional unit because you don't want to compare, you know, if you're doing a comparative analysis, you know, you don't want to compare a lifetime of a refrigerator of 13 years with 17 years. You really want to um, harmonize the, the time periods. What else would be involved? So we can think about time frame. What else? Good. Yeah, that's a big deal, right? The ambient temperature. So uh, you know, your refrigerator works a lot harder in the summer, uh, especially if you don't have your air conditioning cranked down, uh, than it does uh, in the winter. And that's going to affect its energy consumption dramatically. So you need to define it up front. And related to that, it's how cold are you keeping the fridge on the inside, right? So you have a setting you can push the uh, your refrigerator to be colder or warmer. And obviously that's going to affect the, um, the amount of energy consumption. Okay. So these are key elements of a, of a functional unit. They're the ones I identified. Uh, is anybody else uh, can think of something else we should be specifying up front? Does that work? Good. Size. Y yeah, thank you. Uh, size, that's a big deal, right? Um, so is it a big refrigerator or a small refrigerator? You know, how many, how many uh, cubic feet or cubic centimeters? Yeah, that's huge, actually. We didn't specify it in this case study, but we should have. In other words, how much beer can you keep cold? That's uh, important, right? Okay, um, that's great. Um, so what kinds of unit processes, I'll bring that into the fold, would we look at? If you remember that definition of unit processes, these are the unit processes we described as some being inside the scope of the analysis and some being outside. Anybody give me an example of a unit process for the refrigerator? So the amount of energy used would be um, a design characteristic and a flow. So you'd, I think this uh, particular uh, um, metric that you propose would be more like a reference flow, right? So what we would be talking about with respect to the design of a refrigerator is how much energy per hour would it take to maintain the temperature on the inside, say at 5 degrees Celsius, in an ambient of 25 degrees Celsius for 13 years 
and for a certain size refrigerator. So this amount of energy would actually be a flow that is tied to the function of the unit. So we would call that a reference flow. So that was going to be the next question I asked. So you answered that one. So the amount of energy per hour, that would be a part of the reference flow. What is a unit process just in general? Does anybody remember? We had these little boxes, and some boxes were inside the scope, and other boxes were outside. Those boxes were unit processes. Okay, like in your, in your um, case study, uh, let's just use today's example, biofuels. Um, you know, you, you had the farming energy consumption, right, or the eutrophication or what have you. And you were just given the, the energy consumption from farming, but you weren't given the unit processes. The unit processes would be like driving the tractor, right, applying the fertilizer, making the fertilizer. Um, uh, it would be, you know, applying pesticides if that were um, a part of this system, right? So think of the unit processes as each action. And some unit processes are in the scope of the uh, analysis and others are outside. So can somebody come up with an example of a unit process for a refrigerator? Go ahead. Yeah, so there would be a lot of processes involved with making the refrigerator. So, uh, you know, if I were just to try to think of some, uh, you have to say the box is made out of steel. Okay, so you got to make the steel. So you got a blast furnace. Oh, wait a minute. I got to go further back than that. I got to think about iron deposits in Minnesota and dynamite and, and, you know, blast zones and these big scoopers that have to put the rock into a truck. And then the truck's got to go somewhere to a processing facility that makes iron pellets. And then uh, maybe that's, you know, somewhere in Minnesota and they're going to put it on a boat and they're going to go down the Great Lakes and drop it off and Gary, Indiana, and they're going to make steel out of that. They're going to roll the steel. Uh, that rolled steel is going to end up at a uh, fabrication facility. It's going to get uh, punched and bent and, and, and cut. Um, you've got uh, plastic on the insides as well, uh, maybe some type of Luran. Um, uh, you have ver actually, various types of plastics you would have. Um, you've got shelves. They may be plastic. They may be wire uh, with uh, some powder coating on it. So each of those steps is a unit process. Um, the cardboard um, that, uh, you know, is used to box it, uh, shipping it to uh, Best Buy or wherever you get a refrigerator from these days, uh, Big George's or something like that, uh, getting it home, installing it, uh, and then using it, uh, we've got some reference flows associated with it, uh, and then at the end of life, you have to think about what's going to happen in that refrigerator. All of those are unit processes, and when we scope this analysis, we figure out what's inside and what's outside. And that's the first step of a life cycle assessment. And the reference flows are all the materials and energy consumed and emissions produced uh, per uh, functional unit. In this case, a refrigerator of a certain size, uh, keeping the temperature at a certain level over a certain period of time. Okay. So that's uh, unit processes. So the definitions here, functional unit, reference flow, scope, unit processes. Do people have an understanding of that? I want you to be comfortable. This is standard LCA jargon. And I'll give you an example in a, in a minute, but uh, it'll be a lot easier if you understand the definitions up front. Any questions here? How many people feel like they understand the definitions of those terms? Okay, that's a pretty good number. All right, so let's talk about allocation. Uh, what's a, a definition of allocation? Anybody remember? Exactly. So when you've got um, some ambiguity, uh, maybe one function serves two purposes. And you're doing an LCA on one of the purposes. So you've got to figure out how to allocate the emissions. So we talked about that in the context of reused refrigerators. All right. Or in the context of this example, you know, maybe um, you know, a truck goes to Best Buy 
and it uh, has many products on it, not just your refrigerator, it has other products too. So those distribution emissions, how do you allocate those emissions and distribution to this refrigerator? That would be an allocation question. So we use that term as well, allocation. Okay, now these are the five concepts and you know the next 10 slides or so I'm gonna blow through uh, really won't make any sense unless you have a, a good um, working understanding of uh, those definitions. So the answer to the question here, how will you know if the design is environmentally sustainable or not? Well, we have to look at the economics. We talked about that as being a given here. Then we do an LCA. We would, uh, you know, uh, four steps there, uh, define the goal and the scope. First step, second step is collect data. Third step is to look at the impacts and the four steps to interpret the results. And the interpretation here would be, is this refrigerator really, for a given function, a lot better than the other ones on the market? So we use a relativistic definition of sustainability. Okay? Make sense? And this is really what we've been trying to get you, uh, your skills working toward uh, in this class, at least in part three here. So this is our refrigerator for our case study. It's a, um, a low energy refrigerator. Uh, you may have seen these slides posted a few weeks ago. Um, I intended to go over them then, uh, but I think it's actually very useful as a recap as well. So our functional unit, maintaining a temperature, constant temperature in the range of two to eight degrees Celsius, an ambient temperature of 16 to 32 degrees Celsius. That's the function. The functional unit here is five degrees C at an ambient temperature of 25 degrees C. So there's too much variability here for an apples to apples uh, comparison. They did not specify the size, so you'd actually have to look into the study for what size it was, and they uh, did specify the average lifespan as being 13 years, okay? All right. So here's what happens next. It's, it's very um, laborious. It's, it's accounting, right? You gotta go and figure out what are all the parts in the refrigerator, right? So they're all labeled here. So you hear the, the you see the uh, steel box here. You've got the interior lining. You've got the uh, condenser. Uh, you've got the compressor. You've got some lights. You've got packaging. You've got a door. You've got shelves. You've got an ice cube tray. And you gotta go back for each of these products and figure out where they came from. All right, and uh, you know, most engineers I know don't have a lot of patience to do this because uh, you know it's not hard. It's just it just takes a heck of a, an attention span to do this, right? So uh, you know, here's a steel cabinet. Here's the compressor box. Here's the foam, right? The foam insulation may have some CFCs in it. Uh, the compressor may have CFCs in it. Now these days those are banned, right? But if it's an old refrigerator, we'd have to think about that. Um, and and this is a nice diagram. I know it like blows your eyes away. But you know, I want you to understand what, um, and I blew this up right here, like what's going on. So they label the parts. They talk about the parts, what materials are in the parts, their masses, and then whether they were, to they were able to go all the way back to ground. So this is a ground symbol. Oops, sorry. Ah, oh, sorry, here. Right here, this is a ground symbol. So if, if there's a check there, then they were able to go all the way back to the ground. So steel, they were all, all able to go all the way back to the mine in Minnesota. Actually, this is a Denmark refrigerator, so I don't know where their steel came from. But uh, here, the epoxy powder has chemicals in it. They were not able to trace the chemicals all the way back. So in terms of scope and allocation, basically they're not thinking about uh, what's outside the scope here is the uh, production of the chemicals. They just didn't have the data for it. Um, and, and they don't view that as being particularly significant to the results, okay? So, um, you know, so this is just some of the scope and exclusion criteria, so as I mentioned. Um, you know, the uh, manufacturing processes that include chemicals were uh, included in the analysis, but it wasn't possible to track the chemicals back to nature. They looked at manufacturing, use, disposal, they looked at um, this use and disposal being in Denmark. That's important because there's different uh, disposal criteria and laws about disposal in Denmark than there are in the U.S. This study was done in 1990, and actually back then they still had stricter disposal standards than we have here in the U.S. today. Uh, we've got, uh, and of course, the, the electricity grid 
is going to be different than Michigan as well as we've talked about, so we have to think about that. And they also looked at safety, uh, so the working environment as a part of sustainability. You know, they looked at, um, you know, the uh, production of materials. They looked at uh, manufacturing. There's a lot of plastic there, so injection molding and vacuum forming. I know this doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Uh, the mechanical engineers have some uh, experience with this. You know, steel, you know, trimming, bending, punching, welding. you got to look at all these, right? And then there's a factory, and you got to have the lights on in the factory. There may be AC. There may not be. People drive to work, so there's overhead, and you have to allocate that overhead to this product. It's fun to think about where the materials come from, right? So they talk about where all these materials come from. So, I, you know, I know that you know, there's a lot to read here, but I want to give you a, an appreciation for what goes into the LCA. You're just getting the numbers out and applying it. But, uh, you know, there's a lot behind that, and you should at least be aware of that, even if you're not doing it yourself. They make lots of assumptions, as you always need to. Um, you know, they think about CFC leakage, because this was an old refrigerator. Um, there's a rejection rate, so there's failure in manufacturing, about 2%. So you actually make 102 refrigerators for every 100 that are sold, and that's going to affect the environmental impact of production. Um, they talk about um, uh, just dumping the foam, uh, and uh, they are recovering some of the CFCs. Okay, so they were looking at 1995 here. Okay. Now today in Denmark, you'd recover 100% of the CFCs uh, in the U.S., uh, but, you know, probably very few uh, places you go are actually going to recover the CFCs. Remember, CFCs, ozone-depleting gas, as well as a potent uh, greenhouse gas. Then there's data, right? So here's all the data. So the data sources. So these are all the, the materials. And, you know, they're listing where they got the data from. All kinds of different sources. And, and the same kind of thing went into your CFL case study and your, your light bulb case study from last time and your biofuel case study this time, uh, which is why I'm sharing it with you. You know, look at all the various exchanges with the environment. Here's the resource consumption, emissions to air, emissions to water, and waste, right? There's a lot going on here. And we've given you aggregates, aggregate energy, aggregate greenhouse gas uh, potential, global warming potential, what have you. But um, part of our goal here is to make you aware of where that data comes from, which is why we're talking a little bit about it today. Okay. So um, one way to move forward is to classify that information and um, you know, try to take all the global warming emissions and, and uh, collapse them into a single metric like global warming. So here, looking at grams of CO2 equivalent, like you did last time. Uh, ozone depletion potential uh, as equivalent CFC 11 emissions. Acidification, grams of SO2 equivalent, grams of, uh, sorry, nitrate equivalent. Um, here, looking at uh, human toxicity. So take all the chemicals in the life cycle of this refrigerator and add enough water so it'd be safe to drink. It's an interesting metric to use for human toxicity, right? And obviously, humans are more sensitive, uh, or, yeah, the, I'm sorry, humans are less sensitive than the environment. Uh, so you have to actually dilute these chemicals uh, by more water uh, to make it safe for the environment. Right. Now, this is obviously fictitious. These chemicals are being spread out. They're being emitted all over uh, in terms of the production, geography, and over time. But these are a way to collapse all of these types of emissions, right, and make it interpretable and actionable. So if you're talking about a, a sustainable refrigerator then, sorry, you know, now you can compare on this basis, right? Your team comes back to you and they say, you know, we've got our supply and demand analyses done. We think this refrigerator is going to sell. This is our, um, we call it a midpoint assessment, because it's not, the en it's not the end points, right? This is not an assessment of how many people are going to die prematurely from the uh, production, use, and end-of-life disposal of this refrigerator. These are equivalent emissions, and they're connected to impact, but they're not impacts themselves, so we call it a midpoint uh, impact analysis. And we can use this, this is a heck of a lot easier than going through hundreds of emissions and trying to compare them, right? And this is essentially what you've been doing. 
But that process from getting, you know, from, uh, you know, a goal to uh, an impact assessment, we haven't really talked about that or we haven't emphasized it. So that's what I want to do at the beginning part of class. And this is how you do a sustainability analysis. This is how you do sustainable design, right? You ask the question first, are you doing good by the environment? You do your life cycle assessment. You get to this point, compare it to what's out there. Are you moving in the right direction? And then look at the economics of it. And if the economics don't work, is there a policy that would help, that makes sense? Not just to promote the product, but something that would actually be good for consumers as well and be good for future generations. And having done that, then you, you're at the point where you can do a sustainability analysis. Okay. If we had a little bit more time in part three, we'd actually be doing it. But we're just a little short on time uh, to get to that point where you're going to do it yourself. But at least I want you to have seen it and to be comfortable with the jargon. Are there any questions? Is this making sense? You know, we just gave you the data. Remember, we looked at the reuse refrigerator versus the new refrigerator, and we gave you the data just like this. We broke it out into production stages. Uh, it wasn't the same LCA, but, um, you know, it was very similar in terms of how it was conducted. Different assumptions, therefore different uh, emissions. But the process was the same. Are there any questions? How many people feel reasonably comfortable about what an LCA is? Okay, that's a definite majority. Okay, so then we like, we like fast forward the tape, right? And then you get your worksheet on biofuels. And um, that worksheet uh, is based on a paper uh, that you're going to take a look at for your homework. And we just took the data out of that paper and gave it to you because we didn't want to give you too much work to do before class. Uh, so that was just given to you. But then for your homework, you're actually going to go back and figure out where those numbers came from out of the LCA. Okay, so that's in, that's in assignment uh, nine. Okay? Uh, so let's just quickly uh, review on the case study now. You know, we're trying to get you a sense of uh, being able to answer questions about what biofuels are, uh, what are the steps involved in the production of, of biofuels, what are the non-farming practices, what are the farming practices, uh, thinking about the use phase, thinking about energy balances, thinking about eutrophication potential, thinking about global warming potential, um, thinking about comparing biofuels on an energy basis and on a per liter basis, because you get very different answers if you do those two things. Now, you've only done one question of the seven. When we look at all seven questions together, you're going to get that sense, like, oh, wow, if I compare it on an energy basis or volumetric basis, I might get uh, seriously different answers, okay? Um, thinking about the social impact on food prices, uh, so some of you answered that question, and then thinking about uh, sensitivity analysis, okay, which we did a lot of last time. We'll do a little bit of today, too. Okay, so we have our groups. Uh, you're seated together. We want to do the same thing as we did last time, so if you're group one, uh, also, take a look at question three. I'll put the, the questions up there right now. Uh, right here. So if you're group one, also take a look at uh, question three. Group two, look at question four as well. I don't know why I have ten questions here. I clearly misnumbered it. Uh, so let me just fix that. Uh, we got seven groups, and we'll just roll over. So if you're group seven, then you'll uh, answer question two here. I'll just take a couple minutes and fix this. Uh, but let's take about 15 minutes and uh, think about your question. Make sure you've got similar answers. And then also uh, take a look at the, the one question that's uh, uh, too later than yours. Okay? So 15 minutes, and I'll fix this up here. What did I say again? Oh, is that what's going on here? Oh, you're right. Oh, I see. So I messed up on the... Yeah, let me get the questions up here. Thank you.
Okay, I uh, just did a quick uh, walkthrough, and I am sensing a high level of confidence here. So either you all colluded uh, independently to uh, act confident so we could get out of class early and enjoy the day, or you're really understanding what's going on, and, and I'm guessing it's the latter based on the, on the questions that we're getting. Um, the first question asks about um, and, and I can't have, I wish I had two screens up here. I'd be able to leave the question up here as well as the solution. These solutions will be available to you. Uh, first question asks, um, uh, you know, if we substitute a liter of gas with a liter of ethanol derived from corn uh, in a flex fuel vehicle. Now note that most flex fuel vehicles only use 85% ethanol, but here we're just going to assume it's 100%. What is the percentage savings in life cycle global warming potential from a liter of fuel use? And we ask the same question for biodiesel. So uh, who wants to uh, just conceptually tell us how to do it? And then I've got the calculations here, and then we can uh, take a look at the result. What do we got to do? Who did question one? Come on, question one. I, I could look it up, but you folks did question one, didn't you? All right, so somebody tell us how to do it. Do the same thing for the other then. So this is, uh, you know, per uh, liter on a per on a per liter basis. Okay. So uh, you know, a lot of the information you were given, or actually all the information you were given, was on a per kilocalorie basis. And this is a functional unit thing. Okay, because you might think if I'm comparing ethanol and gasoline, or biodiesel and diesel that, oh, it should be per energy uh, released from the fuel, right? Uh, or embedded, embodied in the fuel. Now, uh, the reason that's not a good idea is that the, uh, a liter of fuel may have a different uh, energy density, right? And that's typically how we think about uh, vehicles. You know, we think about you know, miles per gallon, right? We don't think about kilocalories, right? So there are different ways to specify the uh, functional unit, and if you do that, you might get different answers. So, uh, you know, question two actually is related to question one because it asks about, uh, instead of a, on a per liter basis, let's talk about a per kilocalorie basis, okay? And that's what these calculations are going through. So, uh, on, this is one liter of gasoline, so we look at the production uh, global warming potential and the use global warming potential. Overall, you're going to have 0.4 grams of uh, CO2 equivalent uh, per uh, kilocalorie. For ethanol, uh, we need the non-farming global warming potential. We need the production global, global warming potential and the use global warming potential. Now, these two are given to you as 0.32 grams of CO2 equivalent. You need to figure out the non-farming global warming potential. And uh, what, uh, what do these uh, GWP factors do? What do they do? You're familiar with it, right? We looked at it in the first part of the class. Anybody? Good. Oh, are there two people there? I only saw one hand. <laughs> Exactly, and, th and there's a bunch of ways you could do this, but um, you talk, usually we talk about a kilogram of CO2 equivalent, 
So like if we were trying to be nasty on the final and say, okay, here's uh, 200 kilograms of CO2, what's its global warming potential? It'd be 200 kilograms. So it's, it's a, basically the global warming potential factor for CO2 is one. But for nitrous oxide, it's 298, and for methane, it's 25, and that's over 100 years. And, you know, we probably didn't spend, you know, I sat through that lecture too. I, I think that we probably didn't spend enough time for you to really get an understanding, a good understanding of why those factors are different over different time periods. So if we had global warming potential for methane over 20 years instead of 100 years, uh, you'd actually have a value of, um, I think, 12 or something like that. So, uh, you know, those values depend on your assumptions about over how many years, okay? So uh, just make sure if you're talking about global warming potential, you know what year you're looking at, okay? So uh, that's what we're doing here. We're converting to equivalent uh, CO2. Uh, we have the non-farming uh, global warming potential. It should be farming, right? Because uh, I multiply it out here. Um, oh, no, it's just given this way, okay. For the ethanol? Yeah, this is a, this is a, you're the first guinea pigs for the solution here, right? Um, the, I have to go back to the notes. So what are these three terms um, describing? So you've got the nitrous oxide, the CO2, and the methane. What are they doing? What, what, what are their roles in this system? You look back in the notes. Why do we have a nitrous oxide emission or a methane emission? All right, so one of the bullets says uh, farming for corn ethanol leads to uh, nitrous oxide emissions of 7.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So I've written this as non-farming global warming potential. Uh, which is why you shouldn't believe everything you read. Okay, so I'll make that correction. So this is farming, okay, and then you've got the production and, and, and use here. Okay, so just substitute non-farming with farming, and these will be correct. So uh, what we were talking about, though, is on a, um, these numbers that were given were on a kilocalorie basis, all right? So if I just read that whole bullet, uh, it says uh, farming of, of corn for ethanol leads to 7.8 times 10 to the minus 5 grams of nitrous oxide, uh, et cetera, for every kilocalorie of net energy. So if I just compare gasoline and, um, and ethanol on a per kilocalorie basis, I see that you get a savings with ethanol of 12%. So there's uh, basically um, less global warming potential from corn ethanol than gasoline by 12%. But the question actually asked on a per liter basis. So you need to convert from kilocalories to liters. And when you do that, uh, you actually save about 40%. So it looks pretty good for corn ethanol at this point. All right. So you do the same thing then for diesel. And on a per liter basis, uh, biodiesel versus diesel is going to save you about 20%. Okay, is this making sense to people? So basically all you had to do was identify the life cycle stages, the global warming potential of each, recognize that the uh, information was given to you per kilocalorie and you need it per liter. So you make the conversion. And what you get is a 40% savings for ethanol versus gasoline and about a 20% savings from biodiesel versus diesel in terms of global warming potential. Now, question three is going to take you down the same road. So question three uh, says that uh, 80% It's right here. So 80% of the applied fertilizers... Uh, that's a quiz. Study hard. Quick, quick. Oh, yeah. All right. Good. Uh, hopefully I can keep your attention here. So 80% uh, of the applied fertilizers run off into the surface water. You're given values for ethanol and biodiesel for the uh, energy input. 
to the fertilizers, okay? Everybody with me? Who did question three for their assignment today? Which I can look it up. So which was uh, assignment? You guys were assignment three? For question three, who else had question three? You folks? And you folks. So somebody from uh, the center row here. Uh, tell us how to do this problem. You okay? Go ahead. Exactly. And then the next one is Exactly. Wow, you nailed it. Thank you so much. Uh, so I mean, the first part, which was the easier part, was just converting. Uh, so just like we talk about global warming potential, we could talk about equivalent eutrophication potential. So you're given a factor for phosphorus relative to nitrogen. And you can see that on, uh, there's a lot less eutrophication uh, potential uh, associated with biodiesel uh, than ethanol. And the reason, as was mentioned, there's actually three factors. So one is that most of the energy content of the uh, ethanol fertilizer is in the nitrogen and phosphorus. And second, um, you actually need, uh, you have to apply more fertilizer. Uh, I'm sorry, um, your conversion efficiency in the ethanol process is actually higher. So um, actually the ethanol is, is a more intensive process as well. So you put all three of these factors together. And you see a big difference in eutrophication potential, but not a big difference in uh, the energy associated with the fertilizer content. Okay, fertilizers are a big deal. I don't th we haven't talked about nitrogen blooms and phosphorus blooms and, uh, you know, the, the impact on waterways, but that's a big deal. And we talk about massive conversion to biofuels. Eutrophication will be a big part of that story. And it's what, you know, part of the reason why a lot of people think it won't happen at, at a grand scale. Uh, question four, uh, it's here. So uh, we're now looking at um, subsidies for corn ethanol producers to produce 13.3 billion gallons of corn ethanol. Uh, so we assume that this came from taxpayer money and we're trying to figure out an abatement cost, okay? And you're given additional information, and you know, I think this one's fairly plug and chug. We're a little bit low on time, so I'll just kind of walk you through it. So each liter of uh, corn ethanol displaces, um, uh, so you've got corn ethanol's uh, 2,000 grams of CO2 equivalent, and gasoline is 33.59. So you're displacing 13.59 grams of CO2 equivalent. So you can figure out then this is per liter, you can convert it to gallons, and you know that there are 13.3 billion gallons uh, in the U.S. Uh, in that year. So then you can figure out how many short tons of CO2 uh, were avoided. And then you can figure out, because there were $5.8 billion here in the end, it's about $76, uh, $77 per short ton of CO2 avoided. So it's a pretty high cost. Okay. Fairly straightforward. I think question five is as well. Uh, what we're talking about here is um, the impact on food prices. So 
So in question five, uh, we're talking about a family of three. We basically talk about low-income family and a higher-income family. And in the, um, in the notes, uh, you were uh, given uh, the impact of uh, biofuels on food prices. And all you do here is you figure out um, how much that affects the income for a low-income family and a middle-income family. So uh, the use of crops for biofuels has been estimated by some studies to increase the price of foods uh, by about 8%. Um, most of these foods are red meat, poultry, and dairy products on which an average family of three spends $2,000 a year. So obviously it depends on the family, depends on the diet, what have you. Okay, but uh, it's about $2,000 a year. So it's actually not too hard to go through the calculations here as well. So, uh, you know, we assume that there's no taxes in either case. Um, here's the low income, so we got seven bucks forty cents per hour, forty hours a week, forty-eight hours a year, twenty-five percent on uh, on food. Maybe that's twenty percent or is it twenty-five percent? Is it twenty-five? Yeah, change it. Okay. So now two thousand dollars of this is on on food that will increase by about eight percent or one hundred and sixty-two dollars. So if you just look at, you know, here's the uh, total food bill. The food bill is going to increase by about 4.5%, sorry. And that's about 1% of the low-income individual's income. Just going to biofuel. Right, so it may seem small, and it may seem like a big, you know, worthwhile cause, biofuels, uh, but these are real uh, consequences. Obviously, on an upper-income family, these are ones who are usually more concerned about the environment. You see the percentage of their income, uh, it's only about 0.2%. So it's still there, but it's not as significant. Okay, this is making sense. I mean, it's just basically uh, doing a bunch of times tables. All right, so that's corn ethanol. Uh, so corn is obviously a crop that uh, is saleable for food, and now we divert some of it uh, to fuels, and uh, supply and demand says that the price is going to go up. This is the impact on families. Question six talks about land use change. So when we did the ethanol calculation, we did not talk about land use change. Here. So when you now talk about entering biofuels in, the price of biofuels, I'm sorry, the price of corn basically goes up. So land that was not previously used for corn is now going to be used for corn. And you're given information about how, when you, when you go ahead and you take that forest and you clear it, or the grassland, you clear it, you burn it, whatever you do, till it, to uh, make it viable for pasture, uh, for, for uh, a corn pasture, uh, you're actually releasing um, greenhouse gases. And you're given the effect of that, and now you're asked to add it in and to reevaluate questions one and two. Okay, so when you do that, here's what you see. So uh, you've got you had 3359 grams of CO2 equivalent per liter of gas. Okay? This is per liter. Now, uh, here we had 0.3551 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of a kilocalorie of ethanol before you were considering land use change. But the notes tell you that the land use change is actually bigger. So if you're converting land to make it farmland, you're releasing a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And that's going to be 0 0.7902 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilocalorie. Now, you need to uh, convert that to per liter, and you end up with 4450. And that's versus 3359 uh, grams of CO2 per liter of gas. So you basically learn from this, when you include land use change, that corn ethanol can be up to 30% more global warming potential than gasoline. Okay, so while before it was about 40% less, that was not considering land use change. Okay? 
So, you know, a lot of you knew, and we talked about this before, well, we've got to think twice about corn ethanol, but the results initially were looking pretty good. So you need to understand that land use is, and land use changes are a big part of that story. Any questions? The last question uh, relates to uh, net energy balance. And you know, you're given the information, so you, you basically just, all you gotta do is divide a little bit here. There's question seven. So another way of obtaining ethanol from sugars is by using sugarcane as a feedstock instead of corn. Now the sugarcane ethanol combustion yields about 5,000 kilocalories, but also um, you, you get uh, an additional 571 uh, kilocalories per liter of useful energy from byproducts of making the sugar cane. Okay, so this idea of net energy balance ratio is just looking at all the energy that went into making the fuel divided by all the useful output. Or actually, it's the other way around. It's the energy output divided by the energy input. So all you got to do is to add up the... Um, your, your outputs, which is in combustion, and then in the byproduct here, this 571 kilocalories. And then you look at what it took to make it, the sugarcane ethanol, and to transport it. And you take the ratio. And you're also given similar information for uh, ethanol and, um, and biodiesel. So just going through those calculations then, you'll see it here. The energy out for uh, sugarcane ethanol, 5,000 kilocalories per liter, plus the byproduct, which gives you another 571. Your energy input uh, from production and transportation is about 1109. So your net energy balance ratio is going to be a factor of five. Sugarcane ethanol is really good. This is on an energy balance. You know, we could give you the same question for global warming if we wanted to. But let's look at the net energy balance ratio for corn ethanol and soy biodiesel. You see they're a lot lower. And you also have global warming potential issues uh, from land use change. Okay, so the idea here, it's not that any one of these questions is particularly difficult, but you, know, you need to think about the functional unit. You need to think about um, including all the relevant unit processes and uh, just to kind of keep your patience and, and work through everything that the uh, question might be trying to ask you. Sometimes you got to make assumptions, and when you do need to make assumptions, you write them down clearly. All right. And, uh, you know, obviously the math, you have more than enough capability to do. Questions on these biofuels? Okay, I want to thank you again. This has really been a, a great section of the class, at least from my perspective. And uh, we'll give you your quiz. So I hear you pulling your paper out. All right, so five minutes, and uh, please turn them in quietly when on your way out.